Throne and Liberty could be the only MMORPG releasing globally this year to stand any type of chance of dethroning World of Warcraft now that WoW is back to being the number one most populated MMO. And honestly, it has a chance, a genuine legitimate chance. This game has so much going for it, it's combat, it's aesthetic, it's, it's budget, the fact that it is a lineage game set within the larger lineage universe with the only possible hurdle to overcome being whether or not NC decide to plaster pay to win all over every aspect of it, which we all know is entirely plausible, but people seemed more than accepting of that in Lost Ark and Diablo Immortal, so I guess that won't really hinder the game's success as much as I anticipate anticipate it will. Before we go any further, I just want to take a moment here to thank all of the absolute chads and chadettes that support this channel via Patreon. You're all freaking legends. Seriously, each and every single one of you. I would offer to give each of you a kiss, but I suffer from severe intimacy issues. Additionally, if you want to stay up to date with all the latest MMO gotcha and gaming news, take a second here to follow Mrs. Six and I over on Twitter. We tweet daily. Throne and Liberty was initially being developed to be the successor to the original Lineage game released way back in 1998. It originally went under the moniker Lineage Eternal, being announced back in November 2011. However, after releasing a public closed beta for the game back in 2016, players were quick to pan the game as a cheap Lost Ark clone. It featured the same top-down isometric perspective as Lost Ark and admittedly did not look as good. After the poor reception of one of their largest undertakings in decades, NCSoft decided that it would be in their best interest to delay the release of the game while they overhauled it into a state that players would be more accepting of. And that's what we have in its current form, Throne in Liberty. This is a game like Black Desert Online, but a current generation version of it. Not some cheap Lost Ark knockoff, not some horrendous Black Desert wannabe like Elyon. A AAA budget, large scale action MMO that could be the best looking MMO in the entire genre with fast paced action combat directly affected by weather conditions and terrain, a unique class system, and it's launching in the next couple months, not in a beta state, in a fully realized, completely playable form on PC and PS5. NCSoft are no strangers to making fantastic quality games with a focus on both PVE and PVP. The lineage MMOs are, or at the very least, were, stellar examples of titles that exceeded the vast majority of what was offered within the genre during their respective times. When Ion released, it was immediately met with critical acclaim, millions of people playing within its first few years. It was absolutely stunning. It had incredible quality tab target combat and arguably some of the best PvP in the genre. Blade and Soul was even larger than Ion and went on to push the limits of action combat, customization, and graphics. Unfortunately, every single one of the aforementioned titles also suffer from <laughs> excessive pay to win. But given they are all free MMOs, it's a fate that they all succumb to if they want to stay afloat. No business, and MMOs are businesses, can remain running, retain a development team without money. Honestly, NCSoft are smart to take advantage of the current MMO lull this year. Lost Ark launched several months ago with no real competition and went on to garner tens of millions of players almost overnight. Tower of Fantasy is launching next week and will captivate anime fans all around the world for a couple weeks. But after that, we have no confirmed release dates for any major quality MMO title. With two decent quality MMO releases only, this year has been absolutely barren of new games for interested players. NC no doubt know this, which is why they've scheduled the release date for the fourth quarter, October through December. When discussing why the game has taken as long as it has, however, NC went on to state that they originally wanted to make the next generation lineage, and after spending several years attempting that gargantuan endeavor, 
they opted to take the game in a separate direction. They had new systems that they wanted to implement. They had content that needed to either be removed or adapted to keep up to date with modern gaming trends. This is not a game that will feel dated when it finally comes out after years spent in development. Rather, this game is going to feel fresh, this game will feel alive, and hopefully at least, revolutionary. I'm guessing making the game cross-platform between PC and console was also a large part of why the game underwent the change that it did. The studio claimed that Throne and Liberty is a project created by reconsidering the core values that the next generation MMO on PC and console should show. Many cross-platform titles these days are cheap cash grabs, trying to bank on the success and meteoric popularity of Genshin Impact by releasing a mobile game cross-platform onto PC. But a game built for mobile is still going to be a mobile game at the end of the day, as many games, Mir 4, Ni no Kuni Cross Worlds, Noah's Heart, have all proven. However, PC and console crossplay is a very different beast entirely. And this shows. Numerous efforts went into designing how immersive the world is where players play. The environment has been carefully constructed so that many people can continue to have new experiences and enjoy the world in Throne and Liberty. The environment has been carefully constructed so that many people can continue to have new experiences and enjoy in the world of Throne and Liberty. Now I've covered this next part in my earlier video of Throne and Liberty when the game was first revealed in March earlier this year, I was even quoted on the NCSoft website and my quote circulated around every major Korean gaming website online. To separate themselves from their competition, NCSoft are making some very intricate alterations to how the world traditionally functions. There have been various attempts to make field play less monotonous. Even in the same area, the terrain may change as the weather changes, the flow of battle may change depending on the direction of the wind, or you may encounter new mobs over time. Hunting methods and purposes are constantly changing accordingly. The geographical features, the environment, and the player. These three factors influence each other, and we put a lot of effort into making the play come out in different ways, even in the same area. We expect that diverse variables will create a vast array of gameplay. So, we can expect new monsters to potentially spawn in a location depending on the time of the day, the current weather conditions, making environments and further quests more dynamic, reliant on the world itself. The direction of the wind might provide additional resistance when attempting to fire your bow, completely altering the trajectory of your arrow, meaning you might need to acclimate to the weather conditions to not, uh underperform, not that I've ever had performance issues myself. But this is not going to only affect archers or melee players. On the contrary, it was also confirmed that mages will see a very noticeable difference in terms of their spells as well. When it's bright and sunny, your AoE and lightning damage will be a single target spell only. Yet if it's raining and there are storms present, your single target lightning ability will then become an AoE, drastically altering your entire playstyle depending on the weather. And not just the weather, your environment. Water magic becoming ice magic in frigid regions, ice magic becoming water magic in humid regions, the potential combinations are limitless, and NC are making sure this game will be THE MMO release of the year, absolutely eclipsing Lost Ark, the MMO that players accused it of being a direct cheap knockoff of. This game is going to have a seamless open world, just like Black Desert, no loading screen separating any of it, yet it was also confirmed that the world is going to be unbelievably large. Instead of implementing mounts or fast travel, NC have opted to allow players to, uh, well, transform into a variety of different animals. Kind of like a druid in WoW. I know, I know, this is uh, a completely random feature that kind of makes no sense to me. Like, why can we transform into a bunny and what purpose is this going to serve when I could just jump on a giant airship or have a mage teleport me across the world? Like, I get it, you can run faster, you can swim faster, you can jump higher, but why? Now, <laughs> this game is going to be a truly monolithic undertaking and an absolute marvel to behold. 
This could be the biggest game release in years, and could arguably go down as the most popular, most successful free MMO ever. Launching globally, simultaneously with graphics as stunning as these are, with action combat that looks as good as this does, a world completely open and freeing, and next generation features, please, please NC do not screw this up. The entire genre could ride on the success of this game, much like it has with the overwhelming success of BDO all these years. Now if you're curious about Tower of Fantasy launching next week, I urge you to go ahead and check this video out as it covers my experience over the entire 3 week beta test, or alternatively, here's a list of free MMOs that I've enjoyed over the years and I think are currently worth playing.